Although it doesn't happen often, we gamers sometimes do grow tired of having to actively participate in our beloved hobby. During these unfortunate, shameful times, we may turn to movies and television to get our entertainment instead. When we do, it's interesting to see exactly how gamer characters are represented on the big or small screen. Oftentimes, mainstream media leans heavily on dated and downright offensive stereotypes, which can leave us feeling a little bit alienated. I don't want to specifically name any names, of course. Cough. The Big Bang Theory. Cough, cough, cough. Excuse me, I had something stuck in my throat there. Fortunately, there are a small number of films and TV shows that really hit the nail on the head and manage to bring us interesting, recognizable gamers to whom we can all look up. We will be discussing important plot points of these films and TV series, so a spoiler alert is very much in effect from here on out. Don't say we didn't warn you. I'm Peter from Triple Jump, and these are 10 awesome gamers from movies and TV shows. Number 10. Meg Jeffries, Dead Pixels. If you are heavily into, well, any MMORPG, really, it can be difficult to schedule your life around the game. You can't miss that important raid, it's been planned for weeks, and if you don't log in every evening at 7pm, you're going to miss out on your daily bonus, now wouldn't that just be a nightmare? No one is more acutely aware of these struggles than Meg Jeffries, protagonist of British sitcom Dead Pixels, who is desperately trying to balance her online life in the fictitious game Kingdom Scrolls with her real Real life struggles in the world of dating. Is she perfect? Well, no. She yells at fake gamer girls in the street, leads a smear campaign against Vince Vaughn to the point that he crashes his Prius, and lures a co worker's character into a cave in order to rob him, which is really not cool thinking about it. She is, however, fiercely loyal to the chaps in her Kingdom Scrolls group, often putting the game ahead of everything else in her life, including her long suffering flatmate, Allison. Although Meg is far from a great person overall, it is refreshing to see a reasonably realistic representation of female gamers for once. Despite all of her flaws, we're happy to welcome her onto our list. Albeit at number 10, I suppose. Okay, Nikki, Daisy's dead, let's both kill ourselves and start again. Number 9. Young Neil, Scott Pilgrim vs. The World you might be asking yourself why we didn't include the protagonist of Scott Pilgrim vs. The World on this list, and the answer is quite simple. Scott's a bit of a dick, really. At age 22, he's dating a 17-year-old, which is a bit creepy at best and an actual felony at worst, depending on where you live, and then he cheats on said 17-year-old with a girl he basically harasses into going out with him, and then he gets mad at her for having the audacity to have dated other blokes or ladies before him. What a knobber. Young Neil, on the other hand, is a simple man who loves nothing more than supporting his friend's band and playing video games. As a fan of the Legend of Zelda franchise and Tetris, sweet, simple young Neil is seldom found without his beloved Nintendo DS in his hand, and in casual conversation, his mind often goes straight to gaming, regardless of the situation. Can't say I can relate to that one. <coughs> Always ready to step up to the plate when his useless pal Scott is off chasing unfortunate women, we can't help but feel that a spin off series starring young Neil playing his way through the DS back catalogue and going to sex bob on concerts would be far more enjoyable and less problematic than the story of his mate. Number 8. Jimmy Woods, The Wizard Here at Team Triple Jump, we've long been advocates for the healing properties of video games. And got a broken heart? Video games. Had a really rubbish week at work? Video games. Broken both your legs in an unfortunate pedalo accident? I mean, probably A&E first, but then video games, my dude. When young Jimmy Woods is twin si Oh, okay. This takes a turn. Jesus Christ. When young Jimmy Woods' twin sister is killed in an accident, the poor lad begins to suffer from PTSD. Facing institutionalization, Jimmy is spirited away by his half-brother, who aims to bring him to live with their dad. On the way, they discover that Jimmy is quite good at video games, and so he enters and ultimately wins a huge tournament with a massive prize of $50,000, bringing his whole family together and saving himself from a lengthy stay in a medical facility. 
The film itself may just be a 100 minute long advert for Nintendo, but it is refreshing to know that even in 1989, video games could be appreciated for their therapeutic power. Jimmy Woods proves that sometimes you just need to throw yourself into a good game and forget about whatever's ailing you. Maybe not if you have PTSD though, the film was wrong about that. Proper help and support would be far better than Dig Dug in that situation. Broadly speaking though, this is an example of video games being therapeutic that we can probably all relate to in some way or other. Number 7. Alex Rogan, The Last Starfighter do you ever plop down your controller after your 15th straight hour of gaming and think, oh, gee, I sure am wasting my life? Well, first of all, time enjoyed is not time wasted. <laughs> <laughs> And secondly, your favourite game may well end up being training for some sort of real-life conflict, you just never know. When Alex Rogan becomes frustrated with his fruitless existence, he gets heavily into the arcade game Starfighter, which, as it turns out, is a representation of real-life conflict between the Ryland Star League and the Kodan Empire. Although Alex's life on Earth may be lacking somewhat in the achievement department, he's quite the whiz when it comes to Starfighter, to the point that he's abducted by an alien race and drafted into their war. Despite being reluctant to get involved, Alex recognises that though he might not have much going for him on Earth, he has a plethora of untapped potential out there in the cosmos. So, the next time you're second-guessing yourself and worrying you're spending far too much time on Metroid Prime, don't worry, you might just be preparing yourself for some intergalactic monster hunting. Unlikely, I'll admit, but y you know, keep your fingers crossed I suppose. Number 6. Ender. Ender's Game. Unlike the other entries on this list, Andrew Ender Wiggin doesn't play video games for fun, but he is still an awesome gamer nonetheless. In the not too distant future, the Earth has been devastated by an alien invasion which has cost tens of millions of people their lives. In retaliation, humanity plans to launch an attack on the alien race known as the Formix, training gifted children to become commanders of a new fleet. Enter Ender, a young chap with a serious talent for strategy. Forget Civilization VI though, this kid's got real skills, as he proves time and time again throughout the movie, working his way through the ranks with his outside the box problem solving and quick thinking. His mad skills ultimately prove too great for the Formix, and he wipes out the entire race of aliens without breaking a sweat. It does turn out that the extraterrestrials were just looking for water and never meant to start a war, but let's not focus on that bit. We're not here to feel bad about Xenocide, we're here to appreciate what a good little gamer our boy Ender is. <laughs> you go, young man. Kill those Formix. Kill them. Number 5. Kirito and Asuna – Sword Art Online Oh, <laughs> what's that? Two entries for the price of one? I know, I know, I do spoil you. But when looking at the popular anime series, Sword Art Online, it really is impossible to pick a favourite from this adorable young couple. So, we're giving you both. For some people, being trapped in their favourite video game might be ideal, but for the players stuck in Sword Art Online, things aren't all peaches and cream. Two such unfortunate folks, Kirito and Asuna hopefully I'm saying those right, find themselves trapped inside the game, forced against their will to play through all of Ain Crad's 100 floors, Ain Crad, mm, I don't know, 100 floors, or face being stuck there forever. Oh, and if they die in the game, they also die in the real world. It's just like <laughs> Animal Crossing. Despite the odds being stacked very firmly against them, Kurito and Asuna manage to fight their way through all 100 floors, defeat the final boss, and live happily ever after. Well, sort of. There is a whole thing where Asuna ends up in a coma and gets forced into yet another virtual reality game against her will. There's a lot going on, okay? But what's important is that Kurito and Asuna kick some serious ass despite the entire virtual world being against them. Number 4. David Lightman – War Games When you were younger, did your mom ever tell you that you'd get square eyes if you didn't stop playing so many video games? <laughs> Mine did, but it never stopped me. In fact, I wanted square eyes, it sounded cool. I have special eyes. If, on the other hand, mother had told me that my continued insistence on playing GoldenEye would result in the nuclear annihilation of the entire planet, I might have been more inclined to listen. 
Only listen though, I still would have played Goldeneye. After hacking into his school's computer system to change his grades, David Lightman accidentally engages with the NORAD supercomputer War Operation Plan Response, or WAPA for short. The WOPR runs simulations so that it can learn what to do in the event of an actual conflict. David boots up a game called Global Thermonuclear War, one thing leads to another, and he's arrested by the FBI on suspicion of being a Soviet spy. <laughs> Whoops. Despite this slight faux pas, however, David ultimately stops the machine in its tracks by teaching it the concepts of futility and mutually assured destruction, thus saving humanity and presumably launching his career in network security. You know, just as soon as the FBI has finished waterboarding him. Number 3. Ed, Shaun of the Dead on the surface of it, Ed might seem like a bit of a waste of space. He doesn't have a job, he doesn't contribute meaningfully to his household, and he was a major factor in Sean and Liz's breakup. But hey, not one of us is perfect, and we can overlook Ed's flaws on account of the fact that he just loves his PlayStation. If it had been Xbox, though, we might not have been so forgiving. Sort your f***ing life out, mate! When he's not pummeling zombies with a garden shovel... Wait, or is it a spade? Is that a spade? Oh, never mind, I'm sure nobody will correct me in the comments. Ed can be found on his sofa, or later in his shed, playing Time Splitters 2. A fine choice, if I do say so myself. Ed's experience behind a controller undoubtedly prepares him for facing off against hordes of the undead, handling firearms like a pro, and making a speedy getaway in Philip's beloved Jag. But what truly makes him awesome is his love for his friends and his willingness to sacrifice himself for those around him. He gets chomped in the neck while fighting to protect his mates, and even agrees to forego a bullet to the head in order to allow Sean and Liz a quick, painless death. Jeez, someone get that man a Cornetto. Just on you. Number 2. Randy Marsh, South Park When you think of the long list of characters in Trey Parker and Matt Stone's satirical comedy series, Randy Marsh is probably not the first one that springs to mind when it comes to gaming. However, after being called not a very nice name due to his lack of Warcraft knowledge, Randy signs up to the MMORPG in the hopes that he'll get to hang out with his son. But when a griefer starts killing random players for no good reason, it falls to Randy to save the day. After successfully leveling their characters, Stan, Kyle, Cartman, and Kenny take on the troll, battling for over 17 hours to rid the world of Warcraft of his tyranny. Unbeknownst to them, however, they're lacking a crucial weapon: the Sword of a Thousand Truths. <laughs> Enter Randy, a shining beacon of hope in an otherwise helpless world of Warcraft. Desperate to aid the boys in their quest, Randy steals a car, assaulting the driver in the process, and speeds to his local computer store, where he's able to log on and give the boys the sword, sacrificing himself to do so. Many of our beloved South Park regulars, and Cartman, have had some kind of foray into the world of video games over the years, but few of those forays have been quite as memorable as Randy Marsh's adventures in World of Warcraft. Ah. And number one, Wade Watts, Ready Player One. Be honest, if your favourite video game gave you the opportunity to win a fortune beyond your wildest dreams, you'd probably spend every waking moment to try and find a way to get your hands on it. Such is life for Wade Watts, aka Parzival, a young man living in poverty in the year 2045. Wade's only escape from reality is in the form of a VR universe, the Oasis, or ontologically anthropocentric sensory immersive simulation if we are serious about this. When one of the creators of the Oasis dies and leaves behind a contest for its inhabitants, Wade and his friends get straight to tracking down the easter eggs left throughout the virtual universe. Not only does Wade, with the help of many pals, manage to riddle out the clues left behind by the late James Halliday, but he also manages to do so with the evil IOI on his trail. But what does he do after winning the contest and gaining control of the Oasis? Go on a mad spending spree? Become an unbearable douche? No, of course not. He uses is his power for good, banning all of IOI's access to the virtual universe and closing it on Tuesdays and Thursdays so that people could spend some time 
in the real world. Kind of ironic that he makes the number one spot in our list of awesome gamers, but you know, sometimes the best gamers are those that just take a break. Hey, go tell someone you love them, okay?